Hey folks, before we begin today's episode, we have a new book announcement. My friend Dr. Robin Sargent, the founder of Idle Courses Academy, is writing a new instructional design book called The Do It Messy Approach, a step-by-step guide for instructional designers and online learning developers. I was fortunate enough to be one of the early readers of Robin's new book, and I have to say it's awesome. Robin writes in a clear and concise way, but simple to follow and enjoyable to read. Now, you might be asking, who should read this book? It's obviously tailored for newbies. However, I will say that experienced instructional designers should also check this out. As a senior instructional designer myself, I love to hear about other perspectives and seeing what I can pick up to add to my toolkits. And I'm sure you can do the exact same. Join the waitlist today to read 15 pages of the book right now and get a 20% discount when the book officially launches. While there isn't a hard date yet for the book release, Robin told me around June is when it's coming out, so you can expect it in just a couple of weeks, potentially. (laughs) Potentially in a couple of weeks. So sign up for the waitlist today by going to idlecourses.com forward slash book. That's idlecourses.com forward slash book, and I'll be sure to put the link in the show description for today episode. And now let's start the show. Hello, my learning nerds, and welcome on in to another episode of your favorite instructional design podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Luke Hobson. I'm a senior instructional designer, podcaster, blogger, and the author of the book, What I Wish I Knew Before Becoming an Instructional Designer. My passion is instructional design, and I love sharing with you what I'm learning about in real time. So hopefully the tips and the interviews of this show can help you make the transition over into instructional design and to inspire inspire you to make incredible learning experiences. And you can find all my information over at drlukehopson.com. Now, this episode is special for two reasons. The first is that it's my birthday. And to celebrate, I am doing a book contest giveaway. That's right. I am giving away two copies of the book, What I Wish I Knew, before becoming an instructional designer. But not just that. These are actually going to be a signed original copy of the book. When I first wrote the book, Amazon sent me over a couple of what they call author copies, and I found a few. So I still have a couple kicking around, and I am going to be giving away those books. How you can enter in the contest to win, it is very simple. I just want you to go down into wherever you are listening to this show, by the way, perhaps YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, sharing it online, wherever it is. I just want you to be able to share and to tag someone and just to simply give them a compliment. That is it. That's literally the only thing that you need to do. Just want to make this world a little bit of a better place and to try to brighten up someone else's day. Now, you can enter in as many times as you wish. So hypothetically speaking, if you want to tag 12 people and say 12 nice things to them on Facebook, LinkedIn, or or wherever, then fantastic. I will count that as 12 entries. By the end of next week, I will tabulate everything. I will put all of the names into a randomizer, and then I will announce who has won the book, and potentially I am sending it over your way. Either way, though, the whole point is just to make the world a little bit of a better place. So even if you don't win, you just made someone's day, and that is absolutely amazing. You can go over into my YouTube channel if you want to be able to go and see the full contest details as I released a video there as well to explain about the entire thing. Now for the second reason, and the most important reason for why this episode is going to be special, is that this has been an episode that was actually requested by a bunch of you. (laughs) You wanted to be able to have the insider perspective and knowledge when it comes to collaborating and building relationships with subject matter experts. And yes, I have a course on this very same topic. And that's actually where I heard a lot of feedback from some past students was, hey, it would be awesome just to be on a fly on the wall. I just want to hear a conversation between instructional designer and a SME and just to kind of learn more about everything. Take me as far as for being like a behind the sneak preview kind of thing. Now, before I was able to actually act on this, two people reached out to me with this very idea. 
So what you are going to hear will be a review on a new project between Saide Mirza'i, serving as the instructional designer, and the SME is going to be Dr. Eric James Stevens. Together, they've been creating courses on how to use LinkedIn effectively, which is actually really interesting and a very timely type of topic for that manner, by the way. I know a lot of you are using LinkedIn right now. Uh, for some of you, this is the very first time. You've never thought about networking. You've never thought before about trying to have what actually should go on your profile. And for the course that they're going to break down, it talks all about profile pictures, which is also a pretty important topic. So you can go down below into the show notes to see the first course right now that they have designed. And I believe they're working on a series of courses that they're going to be talking about too within the podcast. Hopefully this show inspires you and gives you more insights into how instructional designers and subject matter experts work together. So let's get this party started. Here are the dynamic duo, Saide Mirza'i and Dr. Eric James Stevens. Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> this is what happens. This is on me. This is what happens when you have multiple guests on a podcast, as now the listeners are figuring this out in real time. Though we are joined today by both Eric and Sade, who are currently both over here. And I realize, of course, as soon as I said that, and you both just stared back at me, I was like, neither one is going to say something first, are they? <laughs> nope. Nope. And that is what happens. Well, folks, I will say welcome once again. I am glad that both of you are here because we are diving into something that I find really interesting. And I am so glad that, Eric, you brought this over into this entire conversation because the concept about working with subject matter experts has become something that instructional designers obviously really need to know about. And for a lot of the folks aspiring instructional designers coming over into this field, this is definitely the hot topic item that a lot of people have questions about. And then you had this brilliant idea of like, hey, what if we open this up and both an instructional designer and a subject matter expert come on the show and talk more about it? And I was like, yeah, let's do that. So I'm really stoked about this entire thing. So before we dive on in any further, though, I would love for you both to be able to introduce yourselves to the audience. And now that I just learned from my mistake, I'm just going to call you by name. So Saide, would you please introduce yourself first to the audience? Hi, uh, my name is Saide. I'm an instructional designer and I'm finishing up a doctoral degree in English at the University of Minnesota. I'm really excited to be here and thank you, Luke, for having us. Of course. And now, Eric, go right ahead. <laughs> uh, Luke, thank you um, so much for having us here. And I, uh, I am grateful for the credit of the idea of having this conversation. But I'm going to throw all that to Saide. She, she approached me about this and, and we kind of collaborated and together about different um, places to go. And, and so I'm going to throw that back to her. So it's so a way to go. Like, thank you for um, so many things that, like, honestly, we're going to talk about um, as we go forward. But it was, I'm so happy to be here and to be able to talk about the cool work that we've been able to do. Absolutely. No, this is going to be awesome to unpack and to dive on into this entire thing. So let's start this off. Take me back to the beginning of this project and tell me more about how you to uh, started working together, who connected with whom, how did this really all begin? Um, so I think I would have to take you back a little. Um, I would have to take you back to fall 2021. Um, which is when I started working as an instructional design graduate fellow for the graduate career services at the College of Liberal Arts um, at my home institution. And as part of the job, I was creating a non-academic career workshop for graduate students who wanted to transition out of academia. Um, as I was doing that, I noticed a gap in available resources. Um, most of our graduate students don't really know how to use LinkedIn in their job search. And that's something that you need to know if you're not looking for faculty positions. Um, and I'm not saying there are no resources out there about LinkedIn for graduate students, but none of the ones that exist seem to be effective because we kept getting questions from students about using LinkedIn and we referred them to these resources, to the same videos and websites but the feedback that we kept getting was that students didn't really feel like 
they were learning anything actionable or concrete about how to use LinkedIn, how to make their profiles better, how to use the platform to connect with people and find opportunities. So there was this need that wasn't being met. And I thought, what if I fill that gap? So that's when I reached out to Eric. And I think it was around the same time that he had started posting these really cool short TikTok videos on LinkedIn where he gave advice to people on how to improve their profiles. Um, and I thought to myself, well, I need a subject matter expert. He seems to need someone to help him organize these really awesome but scattered teaching <laughs> to something more structured and digestible. Um, and I, I had been following him on LinkedIn since I think he was... 2019. And I'd learned so much from his posts. And also I went to one of his workshops about LinkedIn. Um, but we hadn't officially met. I needed a subject matter expert. So I reached out to him and I said, would you be interested in this partnership? And maybe I should let him tell the rest oh, of the story. Yeah. And, and let me, I just got to say that I was absolutely floored and, and honored and, and humbled like to, to receive this message um, that was essentially it said like like hey I mean like like we had like we had kind of exchanged some messages before I remembered um, remembered Saturday um, and she said that she had reached out to other people before like looking for a subject matter expert and she hadn't found one yet and and I just thought what how could that be? What an amazing opportunity to be able to work with someone and to be able to help them and to, to be able to help me as well. Cause like, that's what, like, it's, it's, you know, it's all about like this, this mutual, this mutual thing. Um, and society is absolutely correct because I said this so many times, like I am a person that just, I love creating things, love creating content. I love just being me. Uh, we'll probably talk about this later and how it plays in everything. I have um, a diagnosed bipolar disorder. And so I can manically create things in a very haphazard way. Um, and I was creating these TikToks because my theory was if I could go in and strategically help one person really concretely with one thing in a very public way, I can help a lot of people. And then Saidi came to me and said, hey, can I, can I take all of that and make it better? And, and what an opportunity to, for, for, for the whole thing to happen. And I think it was um, serendipitous on it. I, I think it, it for me, that experience put into overdrive everything I'm doing with Educators Network right now. And it was because of this connection, this, this, this request um, from, from another human person that was reaching out for help and me being in a position to say, I need that help and I want to help you. Like let's let's do something cool and something beautiful, and I think that it's it's happening. It's pretty fun. That's very cool. And Eric, I didn't allow you to introduce yourself, did I? Oh no, I think I think. I, <laughs> oh, sorry, everybody. Hi, I'm. Uh, no, I think I just failed to introduce myself. I think that was the problem. Um, I, uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I got uh, excited. I got jumped right in. So no, go right ahead. Keep on keep on building off of that. No, no, yeah, I'm um, the the founder. Um, no, no, I'll just like here's here's my quick rundown. Um, right now, I'm the founder of an organization called Educators.network. And it started out when I got laid off um, in May 2020 um, from COVID. Um, and um, I started the hashtag hire, hire ed. It worked. I got a job as a data analyst, left that job, translated, or then moved into Translate Academia. And then I started these TikToks in January because I was just needed to create something. I was creating three or four a day. And, um, that's when it just, it just happened. And if there's, a, if there's anything that I can recommend to anybody who's listening right now, be ready and willing to pivot onto a good idea and run with it. So that's me. Love Sorry, everybody. No, <laughs> no reason to apologize. No, I absolutely love it. Well, that is really interesting. I'm also completely shocked by the way about how this didn't exist beforehand, because when I saw that idea, I was actually thinking about that, about how no one taught me how to use LinkedIn. I've been on LinkedIn for forever. 
And I kind of just had to like figure it out myself. But if I had to go and try to show someone a resource about trying to use this platform and not just use it, but also use it in an effective way, nothing really jumps out at me besides attempting to go to YouTube and then figuring it out from there. But there's nothing really there. So I can clearly see the need and how this would actually would certainly fill this gap and try to be able to help out people. So that is really interesting. So for talking about this entire project that you were working on, which I think is safe to say that became an online course. Is that what you would classify it as? Mm -hmm. An online course? Okay. Mm -hmm. So what was both of your experiences like before this when it came to actually designing online courses? Like, Sadie, what was your experience like when working with SMEs before this project? Mm -hmm. um, um, when I reached out to Eric, I was a fresh out of the oven, brand new instructional designer with a recently issued instructional design for e-learning certificate. So I had a lot of theoretical knowledge about working with SMEs, but my only hands-on experience was limited to interviewing some subject matter experts to create video resources for our um, students for the non-academic career workshop that I was working on. Um, but that was the extent of my experience. I never really worked this closely with this me for such an extended period of time. Makes sense. And Eric, have you worked with instructional designers before? Um, no, I think it was such an interesting way that you phrased that question versus the ones that you that you prepped us with. Because and I love I love the distinction because you, in this version you asked about my experience with online learning, and I think that 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 impacts what I'm going to say next. Because as, <laughs> as, as an instructor, like I've been in the online in classroom, like when I was um, in academia, I taught online and I, and it was really fun. Like I taught in a lot of different varieties and a lot of different classes and stuff. Um, and, but then there's this question of instructional design and I had to come, I had to overcome the problem that I thought I was also a subject matter expert in online instruction and instructional design when that wasn't my role at all. And, it, and I was, it was, it was, I was humbled to be considered a subject matter expert in, in something that I became so passionate about, like LinkedIn and communicating and using my, my doctorate degree of rhetoric. Um, it was a humbling experience and a refreshing experience to be able to let go of some of those responsibilities that I thought I had to maintain. Um, like there's an example. Um, I can't remember who we were, like, I just like, it's like, okay, like we're going to start doing this. And I created an outline for every, for the course and, and everything. I was like, yeah. And she's just, and Sadie just said, okay, okay. And she's very professional mm -hmm. and very calm. She's like, why are you doing that? That's, that's my job. And I was just like, Oh my gosh. Thank you. Okay. And so my previous experience to this was, um, I thought I had, I thought I, I thought I could do it. I, you know, I mean, it's a natural transition for teachers to think they can go into instructional design. It's different. It's different. Um, and I, and I had to acknowledge that myself and I'm very grateful that I was able to have that experience with Sidey. And not to mention, too, that anyone who works in academia or has that background, you were just used to doing everything yourself. True. That, that is just the nature of the beast is like, I'm just going to do it myself. I'll figure it out no matter what it is. And uh, I could easily see how that would then transcend from trying to be online teacher to online instructional designer and all the the inner workings of that. So that makes sense. So Eric, you touched upon it a little bit already, but walk us through the vision of everything you were thinking about for what this was going to become. Because LinkedIn, for a lot of folks, they have never touched it before until trying to get a job. And now all of a sudden, when you Google, like, you know, how do I get a job in 2022? And it's like, number one's like LinkedIn. And you're like, okay, and now what? So walk us through this vision of, of what you were thinking about in the first place. I, I think that it, it, Sadi had, had mentioned it before. Um, I think that, and, and you, and you just touched upon it too, that, that people today know they need to go on LinkedIn. They know they need to do that. They also know that the position that they're in right now is 
a moment of fear and discouragement and like they don't know what they should do. And then you, on top of that, you have to put on, it's like, oh, I need to do LinkedIn. Like all the work, like especially for the academic teaching crowd, all that work I've done before just doesn't work now. No, that's that's not the case. We just need to talk about it differently. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to create actionable content that was easily digestible that you could go through within 10 minutes. And you can have something concrete to change on your profile and then something to talk about and post. Because that's like when when I say like go get on LinkedIn, it's not go update your education. It's go engage with people. But people don't feel like they can do that until they get, they get some of these other check boxes out of the way. So let's take care of those so you can start communicating and engaging with community. Makes sense. And LinkedIn's kind of designed by that way too to make you try to do like seven steps before using the platform, which is really interesting. When you when you just talked about that, I was like, you're right. There would be nothing stopping me from trying to make connections and talking with people if I didn't have a, a profile picture yet. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I should. But if I was so blocked and I had all of these barriers and this fret of like, oh, I got to do these seven steps before I can do anything else, then that could be a hindrance and someone may not use the platform. Yeah. And it's just, it's a matter of just like, because in this moment of discouragement, the thing that people need the most is to be motivated to act. And that's what like, I feel like I'm a motivating person. And I feel like when I get that attention, I want them to walk away and act on it. Um, and I, and the, and Sadie, like, and Sadie and I, we were, we were talking about this the other day. We we're having a little debate about it, about how much do we want to have like a picture that you love versus one that's professional, like, like how much do you put in your own personality into it? And it was so fun to go back and forth and just to create something that, that encourages people to act because they want to act. Not because they feel compelled, but because they want to. Mm. Um, and, I, and I'm hoping that we were able to do that. I think that uh, society's course, I think it did that, uh, honestly. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, uh, and to touch upon that point, Eric, one of the really interesting things I got for a piece of advice a long time ago was to actually start looking for your job when you're happy. So don't look for the job when you're fretting and you're worried and you're like, oh my God, everything is ending. Do it when you're actually feeling good. And you're like, hmm, I wonder if something's better. And if not, then no worries. I'm I'm in a good place. And that's a really weird mental model to figure out because you're like, do I have to do this? Do I need to? And you're like, yeah, you probably should. People so. are attracted to that enthusiasm and that positivity. Right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. When you go into an interview, you don't feel like is the end of the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all good. If I get it, sweet. And if not, then uh, the world keeps on going on and life is good. So really interesting things to think about for where we're currently at for 2022. But that is the the way that the world currently is. So Sade, after Eric just said all of those things about that, taking us back once again from the project, he shared that vision with you. What were your first steps? Did any ideas like immediately jump out at you that you wanted to be able to do? Okay. Um, so <laughs> my first reaction, not step, but reaction was freaking out. I remember <laughs> um, I wrote I wrote to Eric and said, Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. This is really happening. Um, but once I got over that, um, I knew that we needed to hash out some details about the core components of the project. So we needed to be on the same page about the scope of the project, who our audience was, what we wanted them to achieve, um, what they needed to learn to do that and so on. Um, we also talked about a tentative timeline, but since this was volunteer work for both of us and we each have our own day jobs and other commitments, we agreed to be very flexible with the timeline. Um, and as for the audience, um, I was leaning towards uh, an academic audience, like grad students, adjuncts, and faculty who were leaving academia. But Eric wanted a broader reach. He wanted to include all educators, especially transitioning K-12 teachers. And I listened to him talk about his vision, and that made sense to me. Um, 
and we also needed to decide about the platform. We both wanted an open access course so people wouldn't have to pass through a firewall to reach our content. And we wanted the module to be fun and easy to interact with. But what platform um, should we use? Eric already had a platform in mind. I like and here let me let me I'll preface this, right? I am a person that like when I make a decision, I mean, I think it's the best decision I've ever made because it's a decision that I made. And I said, and me again thinking that I'm the pro, right? It's like, <laughs> hey, this is the net, like this is what we should be using. And this is great. Um, but again, just that key about being ready to pivot when you have a better idea presented to you. And so I'll just pass it back over just because like, I mean, I was, I was convinced <laughs> yeah, that I had the right platform. You came into the project saying, oh, I want yeah. to do this on this platform. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think that was because of your vision. You wanted to create a community of academics and transitioning teachers. And that made a lot of sense because that platform would be a great fit for that. But and, and, and at that time, I wasn't really familiar with the platform, so I had to do my own research. And after my research, I didn't like it because there were limitations that would negatively impact the learner experience. Um, like I said, it was great for community building, but it wasn't a great LMS. So we talked about the benefits and disadvantages of the platform, and we agreed that our needs, like the platform didn't really meet our needs. Um, And we finally decided to publish it on the educators.network website. And and Sadie is being very (laughs) professional. Um, And she like, she like, I think the the joke was like, she always like, she's like, she's like, I was being so sneaky. No, like she, she presented, like, I was like, no, this is what we should do. Um, And as the, as the subject matter expert for instructional design, Sadie was like, no, this is what we should do, and this is why. And I was just feels like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Thank you for 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 pushing back, right? Um, and so it was, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I can already see all the different types of tactics when working with SMEs coming about. This makes a lot of sense for trying to do that because, of course, influencing by far is like one of the instructional designers secret weapons to try to be able to steer a conversation or a direction one way compared to another. But you need to do that in a gentle way, especially for someone like yourself, Eric, who says that I have a decision, I know what to do. And you're like, fantastic. But, but what if we do this other thing? <laughs> See, and and, and, yeah. <laughs> and, it was, and it was the like thinking back to those conversations and I'm, I, I don't, I think I'm remembering them correctly. I don't know, but like, it was very much the question um, like Sadie, she said, like, like, okay, like you want to do that. Why? And then she let me just kind of rant and just get excited about <laughs> why I was so excited about that thing. Um, and then she was able to say, she was able, she listened to me and then she said, okay, but our actual goals are right here. And these are the better tools for those, for these different reasons. Um, and so, and I think that in, if there's a larger message, like if I could, like if, for those who are trying to work with the SME is, is let them feel like they're a subject matter expert. Um, like, like, and just, and just be, be able to listen and, but then just be ready to be like gently guide and be like, okay, now let's make this, this is Rogerian argumentation. Right. And then you just like go in and it's like, okay. And then here it is right over here. And, um, in Saidi's words, she was very, very sneaky, very, very good at it. <laughs> It makes sense. So beyond just the learning platform, if everything else aside, I mentioned to you, Eric, about trying to take your vision and then to move it into the next stage. What was then your initial reaction to everything? I, I think, I mean, honestly, it was, like I said before, just I was in awe and I would just felt so much relief and so much excitement because I am... A visionary thinker. Like I like to think big. And when I say I want to have a course that's available to the public, right, where it teaches them how to do actionable things on LinkedIn very, very quickly. Um, to me, that's like <laughs> ding, and then it's done, right? But Sadie's like, okay, no. Step one, step two, step three, step four. Like, and like, and asking, like, and all these these questions that frankly, like I had considered in my messy, messy head, 
Um, but I was not able to articulate in a way that was digestible. And when I saw the amount of work that she put into the amount of like, I mean, she watched all my content. Um, she read everything that I had posted for a long time. She probably did way more research than she needed to, right? <laughs> but it was good research that she had done. Um, I was just so grateful to be able to see what she had built and just to be able to see that like, yes, because I could tell that she listened to what I wanted to have accomplished. Now I can see how this course fits into the larger picture of what I want to do with Educators Network, part of my educational marketing campaign to provide free quality resources so we can attract a bigger audience in doing these other things. It, it was it, I was able to let go of something that I care deeply about with trust. And that was that was that was a cool feeling to have. It makes sense. It makes sense. It's wonderful, by the way. It shows the type of working relationship and partnership that you two both had. So it's really awesome to hear. And also, well, we're talking about it because it really does sound like a great project, great cause, and everything else of the sort. So after this moment of time, so now you two are currently in the stages of actually working together. How did you two actually collaborate? Like, did you do weekly meetings? Did you have any forms of tools or apps or anything else to make sure that you were both on the same page? Just like walk me through from a project management standpoint. What did you do? And Sadie, I'm looking at you. Okay. So I'm going to ask you first. All right. um, so... <laughs> Um, most of our collaboration hasn't really been synchronous. Um, we only set up, set up Zoom meetings if what we need to discuss doesn't lend itself well to Slack messages or emails. And to be honest, at the very beginning, um, we were communicating via email, text messages, LinkedIn messages. So it wasn't very, um, it wasn't in one place. And Eric told me that he needed to keep all communication in one one place that would help him stay organized. Um, and but for me, it didn't really matter what tools we use to communicate. Um, plus, it's really easy for me to stay organized no matter how chaotic everything around me is. Um, I mean, drop me in the middle of a in the middle of an apocalypse and give me a project. And I'll get it done and I'll stay organized. But Eric needed um, um, to put to keep everything in one place. And I was happy to accommodate him. He actually opened a Slack channel. And we've been using that ever since for most of our communication. Um, but for collaboration, we've also been using... Google Drive and Google Docs, which is where I've done all the storyboarding and I upload the assets that I create and Eric goes there and reviews the material and gives me feedback. And of course, we've also used the Rise Review. Eric, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I think that it was... And... and when things started, mm -hmm. right, we, we, we had exchanged phone numbers, like we were emailing and like we said, and, and like I said, I'm a very scattered thinker. Um, and so a lot of it was not, um, the fault of side. It was because it was, it was, I needed to it's like, okay, this is an idea that now that I have another person involved, I need to focus. Um, and in order to do that, I needed to like, okay, let's focus our attention on Slack. Like, so we use that as our mode of communication. Um, the content that we created was um, primarily done and exchanged in Google Drive. The, there were times when <laughs> um, I, there, and there, I mean, Saidi still is waiting on a video asset for me to create <laughs> um, about the, the backgrounds um, that I can put in there. Um, but she, she coached me through the, 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 the way that I should create my video content and the tools that I should use. And she was very excited for me to use the the free tool that it didn't have the editing access because she said, just give me the raw file. Don't touch it. And that was, that was a hard thing for me to do because I'm, I'm a, I'm a content creator. I mean, I create content um, and to just give someone a raw file is, is, is a scary thing. I mean, I'm getting sweaty. Just think about it right now. Um, but it was, we were able to to find those threads 
Um, and to find those moments because we were both working with very busy schedules and just being able to, to find those moments of communication was really effective because we had a structure on the back end. Like we also, we had, we had opened a Trello board that we were using for a little bit that we ended up not using. Cause again, I'm very scattered. I had big ideas, but then we had to focus. Um, but it was like, okay, like here's this asset. Um, it's ready for me to review. It's like, okay, I reviewed it and I moved it over to the card so that Sadie could review it. And then we created the content or um, Sadie created the content for it. And so the collaborative tools was, was fun. Um, and it was, it was, Honestly, it was exhilarating. It was, it was exciting. Hey, whatever works for you. If that's what you like. As I mentioned, I'm, I'm a Google person as well. That is pretty much what I've always used. And it's kind of funny too when it comes to project management tools because I've used quite a bit from Trello and Monday.com to Jira to you name it. I've, I've used all of them. And like they're all, they're all fine and well and good. But when it comes to working with subject matter experts, that's what I always find to kind of be the thing that I have an, a like a barrier around is that they're either not going to use the tool as much or they'll just ping me with an email instead or something else gets lost in translation. And I'm going back constantly, just me editing the thing where I was just like, why am I using this? It's just for me. <laughs> like, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> like, I don't need this other thing to try to keep track with stuff. So that is slightly refreshing to hear that another group also was like, man, it's cool, but I, I don't know. Um, Sade, what were your best practices when collaborating with Eric on this type of project? For instance, did a particular style or an approach, did anything like really speak to him that you could tell just like really motivated him to keep on uh, him working hard on this? Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. Um, and I think Eric already mentioned this a little bit. Um, I think one thing that really worked, seemed to really work for us, um, is that, and um, yeah, it's that I coached him through what I needed him to do for me. Um, so the instance that Eric gave, I needed him to screencast a short video and I give him detailed instructions on the screen size for optimal resolution and how to manage visual and auditory cognitive load as he was recording the video. And I gave him other notes on what to include, what not to include, what not to do or do. Um, and I think that that type of coaching, um, it really helped both of us stay focused. And I also think it helped cut down on the amount of time that I, as the instructional designer, had to spend on editing videos or preparing other assets for publication. Yeah, it makes sense. So Eric, kind of a similar question to you, but I'm curious, how then did you receive everything? How did you provide feedback? So can you give us like an example of one of the pieces that you gave feedback on, whether yay, nay, neutral, anything like that? Um, yeah, there was, um, there were a couple points, like when we were at the level of the script or not even that, um, it was the, it was the organization of what we wanted to talk about. Um, and so I was like, all right, here's like 10 things that we should do. And Sadie's like, like, let's focus on not 10 things. Like, let's focus on a few, on fewer things. And so, um, like even in the outlining stage, um, and the Google doc, it was, it was like a, an exchange of comments on Google, on the Google doc, um, exchange. That was repetitive, um, and then doing doing the same thing with the with the script because I am I am someone who I, I like to have like a, a colloquial tone when I'm speaking, and I wanted to carry that into the content that we were creating. And the first time I read, it, I was like, "This is great." It was written by an academic, right? Like let's like let's add some conversational tone, like let let's bring that into it. So we were able to um, I was able to kind of coach. And it was, it was only a one-time coaching aspect where I had to do that. And then from then on out, I mean, she just, she got it. Um, and then there were, to your point of like, why, like what tools should we use and da, 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 da. Um, I, Sadie, I mean, I still don't know the name of the the program that she used. I can't remember. Uh, just, I'm, I'm bad with those kinds of details. Um, I know it's Adobe something. Um, and... And really. she's like, okay, like, yeah, like, you're, like here's this, like, here's this thing, like go and, and, and I was like, this is, and again, me, I'm just so excited. I was so excited. I had to, like, I asked my wife to, like, can you look at this? Because I'm so excited about this. I can't see if there's any mistakes here. Um, I had to, like, let it sit for a week. Um, 
but I like I couldn't figure out how to provide the comments that I wanted to. And so I ended up just like screenshotting up my phone and circling it and then like sending it in Slack. Like, I don't like like this is a thing that is that I need to like it, that we need to tweak this or like do this. Uh, there was one example that I'll share. Um, again, this is me being like super convinced <laughs> that my decisions are the best decisions, right? Um, that we need, like, we all right, we needed to um, expand our audience, like, because there's a lot of. I mean, I have a lot of. Um, I don't want to say like of older job seekers who are worried about ageism um, on going on the market, and so I wanted to incorporate older faces. Um, and then I was like, yeah, like here's some older faces, and then and inside she's again very calmly very professionally, very sneaky. She's like, these people are entering retirement homes. Like they are not entering the workforce. They're leaving the workforce. And I was just like, okay, you're, you're right. And so it was just, um, I think that Saidi did a, just a great job of just like containing my excitement. Um, but then, but then shaping it into something productive and to, to a better piece of deliverable um, that we can give to our user. So then that's a fantastic segue. Then Saide, how did you shape his feedback? <laughs> as, you, as you were going back and forth, because this is basically a game of volleyball. You're just hitting it back over the net, back and forth and back and forth. So now the ball was back in your court. How did you take Eric's feedback and how did you work with it? Uh-huh. Um, so honestly, I think there were, there, there were two types of feedback that I've been receiving from Eric. Those that I agreed with <laughs> and those that I didn't. Um, so the first type, the ones that made sense, and I thought they were aligned with our goals and the learning outcomes, I just applied them, the suggested changes. But when he asked, when he gives me feedback and I disagree with it, it's something, if it's something really small, I just reach out, reach out to him on Slack say, hey, I think this is a great idea, but I don't think we should do it for this and that reason. Um, and usually he agrees with me. <laughs> um, but sometimes um, I feel like it's a conversation that can happen in Slack. It's, it's a bigger conversation and has to happen face to face. So we set up a Zoom meeting and we discuss the pros and cons of the changes that he's asking for until one of us is convinced. Um, sometimes I incorporate his feedback by when we agree on how are we going, how we're going to change the thing, do the edits. Sometimes I just incorporate his feedback um, by um, simply changing the text or the design. But at other times, um, I propose alternatives by showing him what um, what I think would look better or what I think would be better. Um, and I think those are the times that I get my, my way really fast <laughs> when he sees what I think would be better. I think he agrees very quickly. Um, and I think in general... Um, it's been really easy working with Eric, um, getting his feedback and going back and forth um, until we're both happy. Makes sense. It makes sense. Oh, I would love to hear uh, from both of you, actually. What was your favorite part of this project? Like, what are you actually most proud of? You. Eric, you'll start. I'm looking at you. Yeah, I... Um, I... I I think I'm most proud for for two reasons. One, um, I mean, the, I mean, I I started everything this this whole whole higher higher ed and the whole concept around people should be making deliverables, and the best way to to essentially help yourself is by helping other people. Um. I have I have a lot of people who approach me for ideas or like they 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 want to help me. They they say like I I love what you're doing. I want to help. And I say thank you. I appreciate that. The amount of labor and time it takes for me 
to understand who you are and what your needs are and how I can use those needs like in a way that's beneficial for both is just is just time that I, I, I don't I don't have. But when someone like Sadi comes up to me and says, hey, I have a need where I want I need a portfolio and I need a subject matter expert. Would you and, and to me, it's like I need learning content. I want this. I am most proud of the fact that like that, that we just we we built something together and it was such a cool experience and to be able to use it as a deliverable for 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 society's job search I mean to me this project was designed to help one person on her job search and if we can leverage this to help more people, then that's even better. But I think that's what I'm most proud about is the potential for helping others. So, Sada, can you top that answer? No. That one, he just laid that out. I should have gone first. <laughs> you should have gone first. <laughs> okay, maybe instead of talking about what I'm most proud of, um, because I think part of your question was, what did you enjoy the most, right? Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> I'll talk about that one. Um, um, I think two things that I really enjoyed. The first one was the collaborative nature of the work, which is something that I don't get often in academia. It's very isolating, the type of research that I'm doing. Um, and then the second thing, it was the design stage. Um, I, I enjoy all the stages of instructional design, but the part where I get to create visual assets and design the web page or the slide layout, um, where I get to decide how to arra arrange a page, both in terms of usability and aesthetics, which is also when I'm thinking a lot about how the user is interfacing, interacting with the actual product and how they're experiencing the space that they're in. And I get to think about colors, placement, and other aspects of visual design. That's the part that I enjoyed the most. I got it. Okay. Like this, I'm... I think I'm For hearing the folks this. Folks at home, part. can't see Eric right now. He's literally <laughs> dancing. His hands are on his head. He's I, like yeah. ready to explode of whatever he wants to say next. I <laughs> the the reason that people need to go out and create deliverables is so that they can go through this self discovery process, right? People think that I want to go be an instructor designer. That's great. Go and do it and discover what you love about doing it. I think that that Sadie's like kind of downplaying what she's been like. The, the characters that she creates are beautiful, and they're they're well designed, and it's something that she is actively posting about now on LinkedIn to the point where she's she's getting attention, and people are saying, "Can you can we pay you to do this for us?" That is amazing, and the the only way that people can go out and have that moment of self discovery that Sadie is so excited about that she's talking about enjoying about this whole thing is to go and do things. And if you don't know what to do on your own, go find someone to work with. It's going to be easier. Absolutely. You were designing all those in Illustrator, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They look awesome. I, Same thing. I, I echo Eric's sentiments. They do look absolutely beautiful. And as someone with a graphic design degree and the fact that I can't do what you're doing anymore. <laughs> like I, I saw that and I was like, that looks awesome. My skill sets now could never do that. So you are definitely, you are just like, crushing it out oh, there thank you. for everything. <laughs> Instructional design and all this too. So that is just fantastic to see everything as well. Well then folks, the last thing I kind of just want to ask you about was lessons learned from this project. If you could go back in time, would you change anything, do anything differently? What did you, you learn from this project overall? Can I go first this time before you Eric sure steals can. all the good ideas? You sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I've learned a lot doing this work with Eric, mostly from my own mistakes. And the first thing that I want to share is that I learned that I have to be crystal clear from the beginning about my role, about what my role as an instructional designer is and what I'm going to bring to the table. Because I didn't explain that to Eric, 
Um, I just assumed that he knew. I assumed that he knew what my role was and what his role as a SME was. But because I didn't clarify that for him, he thought he had to create course outlines. And I had to tell him to stop doing that because he was doing my job. So that was all on me. Um, but next time, I won't make the same mistake. Um, actually, Luke, I learned something from a workshop that you gave at the EduFlow Instruction and Design Program a couple of weeks ago. And I think, and I'm, I hope I'm remembering this correctly. Um, I feel like I'm being tested on my knowledge. There will be a test. <laughs> <laughs> Get right um, I think you said that we should introduce ourselves to the subject matter expert. And I wish I had this knowledge before, but you said that we should introduce ourselves to this me and tell them that we understand how people learn online and that we can help them create meaningful learning experiences for their learners. Was it right? <laughs> you, you passed the test. Awesome. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do next time. That was mis mistake number one that I learned from. And then the second lesson that I learned um, from working with on this project with Eric is that I overthink and I obsess over details. Um, I've always been guilty of that. It's just a habit. And I know, um, I know it's a cliche, but I'm a perfectionist and I overthink everything. Um, I think that's because I fear flaws um, and that can be exhausting and time consuming both for me and for this me, um, this desire, this need to create something flawless um, and nothing is ever flawless. So you end up doing a lot of work and at the end, you're still not quite happy with it. You still think it could be better. It could be better. Um, but as a friend recently reminded me, there always comes a time in a project that you should let it go and release the product into the world. And then you can always go back and improve it based on user feedback. And that's actually part of being a good instructional designer. So that's the second lesson. And now, Eric, I saw all the good ideas. <laughs> you did. I just want to repeat them. Um... <laughs> Like, but just, I really just want to repeat them from my perspective. Okay. Um, the thing that I learned was letting go mm -hmm. of an idea like, like that. I think so up until society had approached me, most of what I was doing was just me in my head, creating content and just doing things. Um, I learned that the vision that I had was big enough to involve other people to create things. Mm. And that just felt amazing. And it was hard to let go of that. And that's what I, that's what I learned. And, and, and I've been doing it with other aspects of, the, of what I'm trying to do as well, like with, with letting, letting go of marketing and letting go of like the, the website building, but understanding like I need to be able to under, to, how these things work together. Saidi, she, you, you, you said it, that academia is a lonely place. Mm -hmm. Like it, it can be lonely. The job I had as a data analyst was not, I mean, it was me and my director. It was not, it was a very isolated um, environment. I didn't really enjoy it. Um, but being able to, to really see the, the beauty of community and the beauty of collaboration and like the, the, it is, it's one thing to have an idea and it's another thing to, to convince other people that it's a good idea, but then to have someone come up to you and say, I want to help you build this in a specific way. Um, it made me feel like a subject matter expert. Um, and that was cool. And so that's, that's what I learned and I appreciate that. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I appreciate both of you sharing all of those things about everything. It sounds like a great project for everything. Where can people actually go to see this, by the way? We I'm are gonna... um, revamping the website right now. It's going to be educators.network is the is the URL. Um, right now, it's um, educators.network um, and then forward slash. I think it's profile dash picture um, is where you can find the first, um, the first example. Um, but we're going to be um, adding the second course here pretty soon as well. 
Fantastic. Man, I'll go and find it. I'll put it in the show notes for you yes. as well, too. But I just want people to be able to go and search for it right away. But other than that, folks, it has been absolutely wonderful to have both of you on the show. It's been absolutely a blast to talk with both of you, even though I've been talking with both of you on LinkedIn for quite a while. But to now actually talk with you via podcast and our own version of face to face, whatever it is in 2022 via Squadcast is what we're <laughs> using right now. So very cool for everything. And I appreciate both of your time for coming on to here for the folks at home. I want to be able to connect with you and learn more about everything that you do. Where can they go to find you and connect with you? Uh, Sadie, I'll start with you first. Where can people find you? Um, my LinkedIn page. Um, it's I did. Mirzai. They just need to search me on LinkedIn. It's a public profile. Excellent. And Eric, where can people go to find you? Um, I do most of my living on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, but I also, if you um, use the hashtag higher, higher ed and hashtag translate academia, um, I have a whole bunch of stuff on TikTok. I'm going to be getting back into some TikTok creation um, as well, which is exciting. Um, but yeah, hopefully that where you're going to be seeing me next a lot is going to be in a metaverse. Like, I, like that's what I'm excited about next step. So who knows what that means? Mm -hmm. Who knows? We'll see in the future <laughs> to be determined. Ending on a cliffhanger. Sounds great. Yeah. Well, folks, once again, thank you both so much for being on the show. Absolutely fantastic to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I had a ton of fun chatting with both of them. It was absolutely awesome to actually connect with both of them as I've been talking to them on LinkedIn for what feels like months and months and months at this point in time and finally being able to meet in a, the, the virtual face-to-face, -face, whatever we want to call it nowadays in 2022, was just fantastic. By the way, for those of you who are looking for instructional designers for projects right now, Side A is available and is taking on more projects. So please feel free to reach out to her on LinkedIn if you are looking for an instructional designer to work with. And once again, you can check out their course and be sure just to follow both of them on LinkedIn. If you enjoyed today's episode, give this podcast a five-star rating wherever you are listening. Also, be sure to follow me on LinkedIn and join our Facebook group, Instructional Design Institute Community. All the links for everything are down below in the show notes, by the way. As always, I appreciate each and every single one of you for taking the time out of your day to listen to some learning nerds babble on about what it is that they love that they do. And I just am so appreciative of you allowing us to be a part of your instructional design journey. But hey, folks, that's all I have for you today. Stay nerdy out there. I'll talk to you next time.